in a game full of loading screens, insanely incompetent UI design, and gameplay that rewards sheer autism willpower, Yango, that's me, and my two best friends set out to do the impossible. Rated Girls Frontline Beginner Guide. Coming up, looking out, I'll survive in no doubt. Never fear, bring it on, break it down. What's in my way? Yango's Girls Frontline Noob Survival Guide. Hello everyone, so that was the anime opening to this guide. Um, so this video will be a big info dump guide for Girls Frontline, mainly aimed for beginners. I will tend to over explain everything and basically start the guide with brain dead, uh, Yango, how I move unit, but then I will progress and do more advanced concepts as well in the guide, and everything will be time stamped as well. Now, many are probably wondering if this game is worth getting into even in 2023, and the answer for a majority of people is probably a resounding no. The thing is, this won't be as casual as other anime mobile games you might have played, and you will have to invest more time grinding in order to catch up with 5 years of content. I would say it would probably take at least 6 months of daily play to start getting teams powerful enough to challenge current hard content and fully participate in current events. Like honestly, as a brand new player in 2023, it's not going to be easy, you're gonna have to kill lots of shit. But if that sounds fun to you, and you are someone that likes to feel mentally challenged, then I would for sure recommend trying this game. Before you play this game, set the battle settings like I have them here. Uh, most importantly, you want to make sure to have heavy damage protection turned off, otherwise your dolls will auto-retreat from battles when they think they've taken too much damage. Like if your WA gets hit so hard that she self-bondages herself, um, she can still fight actually, and honestly the experience will only make her stronger for future battles. So here is a map in Girls Frontline. Maps will take place at either daytime or nighttime. On um, day maps you can see where all the enemies are, but on night maps there is a fog of war mechanic. Now the objective will vary between maps, but for majority of early game maps the objective will be just to navigate an echelon on top of the enemy command center. An echelon is a congregation of 5 sex dolls with guns, and I will go over team building these later. Moving our teams will cost an action point, and we can eliminate the enemies with them. In this 2D combat screen, your dolls will activate their skills once they're off cooldown. Engaging an echelon in combat will also cost it ammo and rations. Now, if an echelon runs out of ammo or rations, they will just stand imposingly in front of the enemy and suicide themselves. We can prevent this from happening by resupplying our echelons at command centers and heliports that we control. A control node means it's blue, and to make a node blue, we just end our turn with an echelon on top of it. Another way nodes can be captured is to have them completely surrounded and wait for the next turn to tick over. These same rules apply to the enemy, they will just turn the nodes a different color. And that's basically all there is to the gameplay in this game, where the complexity will come is from the specific map designs, especially in later event campaign maps. Since the core game is so simple, the devs can just throw any random bullshit they want into their maps, whether it be map interactions, cryptic puzzles, or just something completely arbitrary and random that the devs just had to be purposely trolling. So in our previous gameplay, we supplied our echelons with resources called ammo and rations. Resources in Girls Frontline is what you'll need to do basically everything from battling to crafting new dolls to leveling and optimizing your equipment for the dolls. So there are four resources, manpower, ammo, rations, and parts, and playing the game will consume these resources. So to get more resources, you send an echelon on what is called a logistic mission. So the logistics tab is where you can see the missions you can run, and each mission will give a different yield in resources. For example, this logistic here will give it 10 manpower, um, 32 ammo, and 16 rations, and it'll take us 15 minutes to run. Now if you want to view the per time efficiency, you can click this arrow here, and we see that the game tells us the resources per hour of logistic yields. So I will run this 15 minute logistic as an example. So confirm the logistic, and from here you can just exit out of the game or play other levels and it'll just run in the background. Besides battling, you will also use your resources for crafting T-Dolls. 
So if we go to the factory and click here, we will see a recipe screen brought up where we dump our resources in exchange for a tea doll. And instead of fucking about with these values yourself, um, it's usually smarter to just use the game's recommended recipes that we can find here. So we got all these different gun types we can craft that all serve a different purpose to winning at this video game. Assault Rifles will be your go-to DPS as a new player as they excel at dealing with the low armor waves of enemies you encounter in the early game. Rifles are a high burst damage DPS that target enemy backlines first and they find more use against scarier enemies but will be awful against waves of low HP enemies. And last DPS, machine guns, are even more all about burst damage than rifles but have terrible damage upkeep. Now for tanks, we first have submachine guns which are evasion tanks and the other tank gun are shotguns which are armor tanks. And it really depends on the enemy on whether a shotgun or SMG will tank it better. The last gun type are handguns and these are supports and they can do various things to help your team win the video game. So um, I will use the machine gun recipe here because I'm still missing the gab despite spending over 200 crafts on her raid up yesterday. So just press start and then you'll see there's a timer. So you may have noticed that in the recipe list there was no shotgun recipe and that is because shotguns can only be crafted by a thing called heavy production which is the uh, red square on the right. So if we do heavy production, we'll see that it allows all the recipes for all the guns, including shotguns, and all these recipes cost far more. Um, you are more likely to get high rarity units with heavy production, but I personally don't use it unless I'm crafting a shotgun. So in terms of how often you should be crafting, the answer is very little to never unless there is a rate up. Um, if you are a new player and just can't help yourself, I would just try to like stay under like 4 or 6 a day. The thing is, the crafting pool is limited, so you will eventually get everyone if you keep playing. 2023 Dailies and Girls Frontline is a lot less time consuming than they once were. The number one thing to prioritize to do every day is go to combat simulation and spend your sim energy. Capsule mode, data mode, and EXP mode is what you'll have access to as a new player. EXP mode gives combat reports which insta-level your dolls, um, like rare candy in a Pokemon game. Capsule mode gives mats that allow you to enhance your dolls and make use of those levels. And data mode gives us materials that allow us to level the skills on our dolls. The one to default to in my opinion is data mode as the others can be grinded for in other ways as we'll see later in the guide. The next easy to do everyday task is to head over to the dorm in your base and collect batteries. Um, I have no batteries to collect but these will basically be needed to fully upgrade your base. You can also get more batteries by collecting some from your friends dorms which you can do 10 times a day. And what I do is put the letters D, O, R, and K at these spots and this um, increases my battery collection efficiency. So as you can see, best girls frontline battery collector this world's ever fucking seen. Now last in priority are the daily tasks and the quests and these are just randomly generated every day and they're usually pretty easy to do. And if you don't like one of them you can request a new one so I don't want to do this one. And nice I got one I'm almost done with. Completing these tasks will give you daily rewards, but it will also contribute to your battle pass level that this game has now, which is called Frontline Protocol. This is just a pretty standard anime mobile game battle pass, so if you want to get this um, stupid skin, you can knock yourself out. As you sow death and violence across multiple battlefields, your T-Dolls will gain levels. However, to make use of those levels, you must enhance and dummy link your dolls. So here I leveled a doll all the way to 90, but her combat power is only at 338. So I'll first head to the enhancement screen, and this is where we can gain stats. And to do that we can recycle T-Dolls, and you'll just want to get rid of all your 2-star dolls, but don't get rid of the other rarities. Alright, so we'll click enhance, and we see that her combat rating goes quite a bit up, but we still have to dummy link her, so let's do that next. Now dummy linking gives quite a lot of combat power, but it is something we are only allowed to do 4 times on a doll. So first at level 10 we can dummy link, then at level 30, level 70, and last at level 90 we can dummy link. And after that we can't dummy link anymore, so you really don't have to worry about leveling your dolls after level 90. So in order to dummy link we needed this material called cores, and we needed quite a bit of them. And all a core is, is when you disassemble a 3 star higher rarity T doll. So to be clear, this process will get rid of the doll forever, so only do this to dolls you don't want anymore. 
So the classic meme in Girls Frontline is for a brand new player to craft multiple high rarity waifus, get excited and level them, throw them into a team, and then proceed to have a very bad time and just not make any progress. The thing is, higher rarity t dolls take far more cores to dummy link and it is really hard to farm cores as a brand new player. And it is also really hard to level brand newly obtained level 1 dolls as a new player. So probably the main advice, the main do not make this mistake piece of information for a new player is that when you obtain a high rarity unit that is super powerful and that you really like and just have to use it, um, you must not level it or use it. Why? Because fuck you. Team building in Girls Frontline is very very important. And though you don't have to be super nerdy meta in the early and mid game, um, if all you do is throw the 5 dolls you want to smash the most in an echelon, chances are they will get smashed, but um, not in the way you want it. Let's start with an empty echelon, and I'm just going to choose 5 random shoddies. Here's the team I randomly made, and how this game works is that every doll has a skill and a formation buff. So if I go to K2 here, we see her formation buff right here. She buffs SMG damage by 25% and accuracy by 50%. And then we see her skill, which is just a big blob of text I don't feel like reading. Now for beginner teams, and most teams in general, you should mainly focus on the formation buffs, which we can view here. Selecting our K2 will show her formation buff. The white square is where she stands, and the green square is where the buff applies to our allies. So if I put her in the back here, we see the two green squares go to her diagonals. Now, the thing is, K2 only buffs SMGs, and I do not have any SMGs in the squad. So she can't buff anyone in this team. But if I were to select the shotgun unit, I see that she'll buff MGs, and she'll buff their damage and crit rate. And I actually have an MG right here. So moving our shotgun here will buff our MG, and you can easily tell which units are being buffed because they'll be running and the others will be stationary. So if we look at our other units, we see that she buffs the shotgun, so that's a synergy. She buffs SMGs, and we have no SMGs in the squad. And then this girl will buff HGs, and we have no HGs in the squad. So this team is pretty bad because there's really only one synergy between this unit and this unit. So randomly selecting my dolls unsurprisingly made a very lackluster and disappointing team, and the reason for that was mainly due to bad formation buffs. Now luckily you don't have to memorize what every unit buffs in this game, as there are some general rules with very few exceptions. In general, assault rifles and submachine guns buff each other, machine guns and shotguns buff each other's, and rifles buff handguns while handguns buff everything. Now using these rules we get the three basic formations of ARSMG, MGSG, and RFHG. So the first basic formation I'll go over is ARSMG, which if you're a new player this will be your go-to formation for a while. Um, it does fall off later, but I wouldn't worry about that until you actually get to that point. Standard AR SMG will be slap a support here, put two DPS assault rifles on the top and bottom square, and then in the front you'll have two SMGs. So the first example here is the AR SMG squad I recommend to beginners. So here's the formation as we discussed, and the important thing to realize here is that the AR in the center here, who is M4A1, actually buffs other ARs, which is why she counts as a supporter. Most ARs do buff SMGs, but M4A1 is an exception to the rule, which makes her good for the support slot here. Ribeye Rolls is another commonly used support assault rifle that buffs other assault rifles. The main tank on the team should buff both your DPS assault rifles and ideally have a skill that decreases the damage your team takes. Examples of SMGs with good tank skills would be UNP-9 Stun Grenade which paralyzes the enemy and causes them not to fire, or Ro 635's damage debuff and increased evasion which allows her to tank a lot. Honestly, most SMGs have a tank skill, unfortunately Sten King does not so this would probably be the first unit to replace on this beginner team. MP5 I think is rewarded in chapter 4 and she's a pretty good replacement. Now this other SMG is kind of a fill slot where you either add something that helps you tank even more or you add an SMG that does DPS. 
Most standard is to add a DPS SMG, such as Scorpion here, who will throw a fire grenade at the enemy. So here's another example of an AR SMG, but this time using a handgun in the support role. So you'll want to use a handgun that will buff both of the DPS ARs next to it, and ideally give a firepower buff. And then most commonly, this handgun will have a skill that further enhances the DPS. So this handgun has a skill that increases all our allies' damage by 25% for 8 seconds. Other examples of handguns that can work in the support position would be Grizzly and K5. And then the last version of AR SMG will have three ARs and only one SMG tank. And this is only really viable if you have a really tanky SMG, like a uh, Row mod is super tanky, so she doesn't really need any help at tanking. So this formation, the HG will need to be a frontliner and ideally buff all the back lines, so very few handguns even do this. And similarly, you can opt for two handguns and one SMG if you're confident your SMG can solo tank. And this can also be very powerful for bosses or buffing for a big grenade bomb like this formation does. RFHG is a total glass cannon formation where the goal is to murder the enemy before they even fire at you. The formation is two rifles and three handguns to buff your rifles. When picking what rifles I want to use, I like to think of them as being in two categories. The first category are generalist rifles that include any rifle that self buff their stats. Examples would be WA who buffs her rate of fire, M14 who buffs her damage, and R93 who buffs both of those stats. The other category for rifles are specialists, and unfortunately you guys, you're just gonna have to get good to learn when to use these. But if you have to reread a skill description more than twice to fully comprehend it, then it's probably a specialist. Example specialists would include Grape Carcana, who is a go-to against elite enemies. M200 is good against high evasion enemies, but she's also good against low armor, high HP enemies. And HS50 is a doll I leveled earlier in this guide because I've been getting absolutely shit canned by high armor enemies in recent events, and this doll should be able to counter that. Now for general content, and especially early game new players, generalist rifles will be the one to default to, and specialists will be the ones you sub in. Now for choosing the three handguns, I usually try and mix the formation buffs. That is because too much of one buff will have diminishing returns. Rate of fire is hard capped at 120 in this game, crit rate will diminish in value, and too much damage can also be bad. Let's say we have two 100 HP enemies and R93 does 80 damage to one of them. Well when she kills it on our next shot, we effectively will lose out on 60 damage here. The rule I follow when picking handguns for an RFHG is to have no more than two give a duplicate buff. And then ideally the handguns will have good tiles and skill synergy as well. So the first team I made is one for new players, using dolls that the game will give you for free. And um, this is the best I can come up with. So um, for handguns we have two firepower buffs and a crit rate buff. Now this handgun is unfortunately only buffing one of our rifles, which ideally we want all our handguns to buff both the rifles. Here's an example of a much better team that you can build once you get some more options. So I'm using WA2000 as a rate of fire DPS and M14 as my firepower DPS. But the key is mixing the handgun buffs. So um, in this team I got two handguns buffing firepower and then another buffing both rate of fire and crit rate. And then the handgun skills themselves are all very offensive which is what we want usually since the point of RFHG is to kill the enemy before they fire at you. And here's another team with the exact same rifles, just different handguns, but the idea of mixing buffs is the same. So to recap, my advice is to pick two generalist rifles you like the look of, and pick three handguns with mixing tile buffs. And if you follow that advice, you'll absolutely shit can all armored enemies in the early and mid game. But once you get later in the game, generalist rifles will start to struggle against certain enemies. And this is when more specialized rifles will become more relevant. So here's one of my example teams I claimed was really good, fully equipped, and in formation. So with it, I'm going to challenge this enemy from last ranking I saved, and to not bias anything, I won't micro any of my dolls. And to be clear, this enemy comp was one of the weaker trash comps, and it's going to completely roast this pretty strong RFHG team no problem. So you will for sure start getting roasted late game in Girls Frontline, and there's really no two ways about it. So pretty convincing loss, and if we analyze why this team lost so badly, basically the problem was our DPS rifles were taking ages to kill this on um, dildo structure. This is a stupidly annoying high HP enemy that will also remove our team buffs if we let it live. 
And when you need to deal with a very specific enemy is when you start subbing in specialist rifles. So here a good rifle for our issue is Grape Carcano who will do very high damage to elite enemies. So I just subbed in a Grape for my M14 and made no other changes so let's see how rebattling this goes. So keeping an eye on the dildo, we see Grape just one taps it and this is going to completely change the outcome of this battle as WA can start DPSing down the other armored mechs and our buffs will stay active. Active. Um, now I still do take a lot of damage, but I will come back to this example battle in the kiting section of the guide. Last basic formation is MGSG, and it can either be for burst battles or stall battles. So the formation will be three machine guns in the back with a main tank shotgun up front. As for the last stall, it can either be a supporting handgun or just another shotgun. For team building MGSG, you can't really screw it up honestly and can use whatever as long as you put it in formation. Though later in the game, really just on the very hardest maps or ranking, I do find the more stally machine guns to be superior. Machine guns I personally like are RPK-203 who gives a taunt and has constant DPS similar to an assault rifle. RPK-16 gives a similar constant DPS. I also use Cord a lot because I find the AoE damage useful, and Lewis buffs herself every reload which is perfect for longer fights you get into in the later game. So here's an example SGMG team I would use for more late game difficult battles. So the two shotguns can be whatever honestly, but importantly the three machine guns I chose all buff armor which will just give us a very tanky frontline. So yep, there you have it, taking zero damage here. And this is kind of how I like to use SGMGs lately. Um, I just buff my shotgun's armor a lot and stall out the enemy. Coalition's echelons is pretty much you get to play as the bosses. So here is my Scarecrow echelon, who you will get for free, and honestly she is my favorite. Um, similar to doll echelons, you set the formation, and the boss woman will buff everyone no matter what tile she is on, and her henchmen don't do tile buffs. So there's really not too much complexity in building these squads, um, I mainly just spam these spider dudes in all of mine and call it a day. You will also need to set gear on your boss woman, the most useful one is phantom stance and the rest are kinda whatever. This gear is gotten at the protocol control center in the uh, tactical chip station here. And then to actually get coalition units you uh, go to the coalition capture operation. And this is basically just like doing banner pulls in a gotcha game. How it works is that there's 100 units in the pool, one of them is the boss woman, and then 99 are her henchmen, and I'll say what's all remaining here in the henchmen. So I got 6 summons out of 14, um, you regenerate your summons over time depending on how leveled your protocol assimilation center in the base is. So I'll try to get this purple haired henchman lady, um, skip the stupid animation, and nice I got her. When you get your first coalition echelon at um, I think commander level 60, it will probably be a lot stronger than any of your doll echelons so I imagine it's a great way for beginners to more easily blast through early and mid game. In the late game, coalition echelons do fall off for um, a variety of reasons but they can still be good, just not omega OP broken as they seem when you first unlock them. So do make sure you're still building doll echelon teams. Microing in this game is something you'll need to do more and more of as you farther progress into the game. Um, I first recommend if you're playing on PC emulator to set hotkeys for all of these buttons. In this game, before enemies annihilate your sex dolls, they will first go through a stop and setup animation. We can exploit this mechanic by moving our doll back a tile after the enemy stops which buys us more time to kill it. This can be furthered autism by moving our doll back and forth two tiles. If there are no more tiles to retreat to, then we can still kite by withdrawing our unit. So here's a sped up fight without kiting. And here's that same fight but using kiting techniques. Similar to the enemy, dolls will also have to stop and set up before they shoot. This can happen if the enemy is not in our line of sight causing our echelon to run forward and it's really annoying if a machine gun gets caught mid reload animation and has to do this. However, if we move any of our dolls our echelon will be forced to be stationary and we can make the enemy come to us. After a doll moves to a tile their unit targeting is also reset. 
Remembering that rifles prioritize the farthest away enemy and other guns prioritize the closest enemies, this can also be a useful tactic. For example, here all of our dolls are targeting this big zombie guy since he is the closest one to them. However, when the zombie henchmen make their way to our SMG dolls, they allow Ro and JS9 to just get mauled to death. That is because they won't switch targets until their current target, who is the big zombie guy, is dead. So the way we counter this is to reset the targeting of one of our dolls by moving tiles. Now obviously we don't want to spend the time to move our doll to a whole new tile, but what we can actually do is quickly shuffle a doll back and forth and their targeting will be reset. So here's how that looks faster, where I am just resetting my AK-12 to target all the small zombies. Okay, let's apply all these hot maneuvers and see how it all comes together now. Um, I'll fight the late game enemy that the previous RFHG team got ass blasted by because I didn't micro them, and this time I'll use the newfound micro knowledge we have. First I run my grizzly up and move her back and forth to make sure my team remains stationary. Next, once the big white mechs are in her vision, I shuffle my WA-2000 to reset her targeting. Since the initial enemies in our vision were the shield henchmen, WA is targeting them, but resetting her will make her reprioritize the backline. So now WA is killing the topmost white mech. The second mech is kited back by Grizzly to buy a rifle's time to kill, and at the same time I move my 5-7 similarly to kite to melee attack and buy more time. And then the rest of the battle is just doing one last kite by withdrawing our unit. So there we have it, I think that's a pretty good example battle where all the pro maneuvers come into play. There is also enemy specific kiting in Girls Frontline, but that will be more obvious once you run into them. For the final section in this guide, I'm just going to walk through the process of me obtaining and leveling a doll from zero to usable. So type 56R here is a doll I don't have that I want to get, so I'm going to see how to obtain her from the girls frontline wiki. Here's her wiki entry, and it looks like she's a drop in Arctic Warfare, so many of the dolls in this game cannot be crafted and you actually have to manually grind for them. So in the Arctic Warfare campaign, we can click the levels and uh, view the dolls that drop, so 56 is not in there. Alright, she can drop in 1-3, so I have to farm this map. So holding on an enemy, you can view the dolls it drops, and you just have to kill the enemies that drop the doll you want. And it is a pretty low probability you get the doll you want, so you just have to keep trying until you do. These five enemies here can drop what I want, so I'm just going to kill them and restart the map until I get her. I didn't get her, so what I do is I'll retreat all my echelons to conserve my resources, and terminate and restart the battle. And unfortunately, this will take a lot of tries. To level this doll, I can give her these um, combat reports, and this will instantly gain her levels. So she's already at level 23. Now these combat reports are pretty limited, so it's often preferred to manually leveling them, and you do that by just killing a bunch of shit with the doll in an echelon. On the internet, you'll see many farming maps recommended, and it really depends what year the guide was made in, whether these recommendations even make sense. In 2023 Girls Frontline, I would say the three farming maps you should focus on unlocking and then grinding is 02, 124E, and then 13-4. So to start out, I'll just put this doll in an echelon to carry her, and actually if you move her all the way to the leader position, she'll gain slightly more XP. Here is stage 02, and as a new player, you're going to be here for a fucking while. And the route is just gonna be here and then here.
The downside to manually leveling is that it causes us resources to resupply our echelon which can add up over time, but to counteract this there is a method of leveling known as corpse dragging, where the idea is instead of resupplying 5 of our dolls we just resupply one of them, and how you corpse drag will vary on the stage. To corpse drag 02 we first want M16A1 and ideally we get as high level of these equipment as possible. Um, even better if you have her unique equipment for here. And then you'll also need two DPS assault rifles, preferably grenaders. So I got soap mod here, and then a uh, FAL here. And we fill the remaining three slots with the dolls we want to level. Okay, so I want to level these three dolls, and then in the leader position, you'll want to put the doll you want to level the most. So I want to give her the most levels. For the formation, copy what I have here. How Corpse Dragon works is that before you start the map, you need to swap out your carry DPS for the one with ammo. So my carry here has no ammo, but in my Formation 2, Soap Mod does have ammo, so I just swap them in the Echelon Formation screen before starting the battle. And once we swap, we want to deploy both our Echelons. And the second Echelon, consisting of the other carry, will just be resupplied and retreated. And what effectively happens is that all our dolls don't use any ammo or rations except for our carry assault rifle. Pretty much any level 90 assault rifle can drag 0-2, but the best ones are grenaders. The next good and easy to farm map you will unlock won't be until 12-4E, and for this map any shotgun or M16 will work as a tank. And the best draggers are 416 and K11, and soap mod kinda works as well. Here's the formation for this corpse drag. The Dragon Squad will be deployed at the bottom here, and the Solo Dragger will be deployed at the top command post. So we do the same resupply retreat maneuver, and then as for the path, it will just be this. The best farming map in the game currently is 13-4. It gives you the most XP and you can level 4 dolls at a time instead of 3 if you have enough firepower. Here's the formation for this drag. Basically at this top position you will put a grenade SMG such as Vector, Scorpion, or Micro Uzi. And usually I just give my Vector at least 2 firepower buffs and things tend to work out. So the route for this drag is this. And basically the goal of the drag is that your nader should be about one-shotting all the enemies, and if they aren't then you need more firepower. Alright, fuck me, that's gonna do it for this guide video. Here's a list of topics I can think of that I didn't cover, and they don't really become more relevant until later, but you may want to read or ask other players on these things once you get to that point in the game. Specifically, late game echelons, you will start to focus less on formation buffs and more on individual doll skills. This means that learning what each individual doll excels at becomes more important, and I personally use the Trap Midget Guide website to read about what the dolls are good at if I'm unsure, so I will make sure to link that website in the description of this video. Anyways, get me out of here, bye.